All right, let's get started. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Stronger Marriage webinar. Uh, my name is Camilla Brees. I'm the Stronger. I'm the Marriage Commission coordinator, and I'm excited to introduce our special guest, Dr. Dave Schramm, with you today. Um, Dr. Dave is, is an associate professor in family life Ex extension specialist at Utah State University in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies. After graduating with his PhD from Auburn University, he worked as a professor at the University of Missouri for nine years. Since arriving at USU in 2016, he serves as the Utah Marriage Commission faculty co-director and he appears, in he appears monthly on Fox 13's The Place and he launched a Facebook page where he shares research and tips on helping individuals, parents and couples flourish. From British Columbia to Beijing, China and from St. Louis to San Diego, Dr. Dave has given over 500 presentations, classes, and workshops to a variety of audiences. His work centers on promoting happy and healthy relationships, including romantic and marital, marital relationships, parent-child relationships, co-parenting, and promoting flourishing individuals. Today, Dr. Dave's presentation will be, is titled, what, hap what Happened to Our Relationship Connection? Tips for Feeling Closer Again, where he'll be teaching us tips to strengthen our connection with, with our partners and push back on the distractions of our daily lives. Um, though there will be a Q&A session for the last 15 to 20 minutes of this webinar. Um, and you have the option of submitting anonymous questions or you can have your name included just depending on um, what you prefer. So make sure to make that selection when you um, ask your questions and please save those questions for the end. Um, the chat is disabled. So if you think of one during the presentation, just write it down and, and save it for later so we can address that. Um, this work, workshop is also approved for one continuing education credit. You can email me at marriagecommission.usu.edu to request a certificate. All right, thank you so much, Dave, for um, being a part of this with us and sharing your knowledge with us today. I'm gonna turn the time over to you. All right, hey, thanks, Camilla. Uh, Camilla does great work for us here at Utah. Um, Commission on Marriage. So grateful to her. I'm, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, either you are, you know, crazy bored, or you're hopefully here to improve your relationship. Um, and now I want to start out with a little ca caveat here, saying that uh, what I'm going to be sharing tonight is it's assuming that there is not, um, you know, power and control and abuse and neglect and violence and those kind of darker sides of relationships. I, I highly recommend. Um, turning to counselor or professionals to help with that. This is more relationship education. Uh, again, I, I hope it's helpful. I'm super excited to be sharing some things that I have not shared before. Um, so I'm going to jump right into it and share my screen. All right. Um, let me share a little bit about what the SRAM fam, the SRAM fam did recently. We just went on a vacation to Disneyland. We thought this is kind of one last hurrah before. Um, so we have a 20 year old, 18 year old, 16, and our son is 14. So three daughters and our son. And they're kind of going different directions in their lives. And so we had a great time at Disney. And then we had a little surprise. And we flew out our daughter's boyfriend, who's going to propose at Disneyland. How crazy, right? Cool is that? So here, show me a little bit of a, a sneak peek into kind of what happened. So here she is. And then John, her fiance, he comes from behind the castle. He's been hiding there and she's getting these pictures done by Disney photographers. Each of us kind of did our, our turn. And then he comes up, surprises her. She was actually shocked in this video. She like jumps back and she, she's like, wait a minute, what are you doing here? And then she is so excited. He gets down on a knee, the crowd gathers, they all start clapping. It's this, this magical right Disney moment of the happiest place on, on earth. And so it was, it was pretty amazing, pretty magical. She kisses him, the crowd goes crazy, uh, getting her picture taken. So what? What happens at our relationship? Do you remember back to this? Maybe it wasn't Disney, but all of us had this, this magical time when um, it was just us and it was just exciting and sparks and planning the wedding and all of this. So what happens from, you know, the I love you to, to I bug you? This was a, a little bit later during the day and then we're in long lines and things. And so this is kind of just a, a funny picture showing what happens in our relationships. And this happened within about an hour. We go from this excitement to, oh my goodness, yeah, you're, you're bugging me. They weren't really bugging each other. I just happened to get this, this pic of them kind of going um, crazy. At Disneyland. So, but I really wanted to, to talk about what do you want 
I, I just want to ask you just flat out, what do you want from marriage? What is it ultimately, if you were to boil it down to like one or two words, what is it? Why, why did you get married? What are we searching for? And some might say love. And, and I agree that we are in love. I want somebody to, to love and to love me back. And, and I would argue that in addition to love, that what we really want in our in marriage, in our relationships is connection. It, it's about connecting. It's about becoming one. It's about um, sharing, sharing everything, sharing bank accounts, sharing, sharing our bed, sharing a, a bedroom and bathroom and sharing everything. Well, maybe not everything, right? You don't share straws or don't share a toothbrush. Have you ever done that? That's disgusting. Um, or even, heck, heaven forbid, don't share your, your phone charger, right? But, but for the most part, we want to, to feel valued and connected and understood and appreciated. Ultimately, most people, we, we want to be one and, and not in that, you know, the weird sense of that, but really to that closeness and connection, both emos emotionally and physically connected to become one. Isn't that ultimately what we want? Now, I would argue right off the, the bat, here's six gifts that you can give your partner, your spouse. Some of the six best gifts that you can ever give, in my opinion, are these. It comes down to giving your spouse your love, your trust, your attention, kindness, appreciation, and forgiveness. And there's all kinds of other, you know, patience and all these other gifts that we can give our partner. But I want to say right off, right up front, that one of the best gifts you can give another person, another human being, is your attention. It's your full, it's not necessarily even your time. For example, the best gift that you can give me right now is it's not your time. It's actually your full undivided attention. And now today, more than in any other period in history, there are so many things that are competing for our attention. So getting back to my daughter, her now fiance, they're in the process of beginning, you know, their stages and planning the wedding. And you think back to your own planning stages and your own honeymoon and how exciting and wonderful that is. I compare our relationship connection. I compare it to a relationship pool that we do things, we do things, we go out, we have a fun time, we go out on dates, we go to a movie, we are laughing, and we're putting basically a cup of connection into the relationship pool. And over time, that, that pool gets hopefully deeper and deeper. And now, but I do want to say that, that it's not just time that will do that. It's, it's attention, and it's intentionally adding cups of connection to your pool. And in the beginning stages, it seems like it's easy and it's obvious and we have so much fun that we're putting gallons at a time into this relationship pool and it's getting deeper and deeper. And then we go through things. We go through hardships and tough times where it feels like, wow, that was a struggle, but I feel closer to you. My wife and I, for example, she had a brain surgery uh, within a couple of years of us getting married. And I thought, man, what? Did I marry a lemon? Right? No, no, I was just kidding. I love my wife. But but it seems like some of those struggles and the tough times as well add cups of connection. They draw us closer. It's not just the fun times. So there's all kinds of things that we do to add cups of connection to that relationship pool. But I, I want to share some uh, right off the bat, I think kind of starting from a big picture of what we all need, that there are at least three fundamental human needs that we are all born with. And we take these into uh, marriage as well. The first need is the need for safety. Now, not just um, physical safety, food, clothing, shelter, and ha having a good job and being able to provide. Those are important, financial safety. And, and those feeling like, yeah, man, we're, we're set and we are, are able to, uh, to live and, and to survive. But in addition to that, even deeper than that, I would argue, is emotional safety. Feeling like, like we can risk, like we can say something and not be burned or made fun of. That we can share the that, that innermost parts of our hearts and secrets and hopes and dreams and fears and frustrations. That we're able to open up and share that. And when that need is met, the feeling is peace. That I feel at peace with this person. The second need that we all have in human beings and in our relationships is the need for satisfaction, to do fun, enjoyable things, to go on fun dates, to have these fun surprises and have the sparks fly, good times, exciting times. 
to do fun, enjoyable things, both individually and as a couple. And when that need of satisfaction is met, then the feeling is contentment. We feel, yes, I feel content. I feel like the things are going well in our relationship. And ultimately, I talked about it earlier, the third need that we all have is the need for connection. We're all born with this, this longing for belonging, this craving for connection with other people, even if we're not a, a people person. We want to, to connect with others. We want to be able to share things with another person and with that one special person to do fun, enjoyable things, but to be able to, to you know, have humor and kindness and gratitude. And yes, sexual intimacy is part of that, that connection, that physical union, that connection is special. So when that need is met, the feeling is a feeling of love. Now, what happens in, in a lot of relationships is one or more of these needs, and there's other relationship needs, and we'll actually talk about some of these, but these are our basic fundamental human needs is safety, satisfaction, and connection. Now, I talked about the relationship pool. So we have this, we're dumping cups of connection, we're on the same page, we're laugh, laughing. Now, all relationships, even my, all relationships will experience times where I call these drainers, and I'm going to share eight Ds of disconnection, things that kind of oh, come along and that slash things out of the pool or loyalty leaks and where water escapes that and I don't feel as close and connected to you. Now, little caveat again, hopefully that you're not taking these as guilt trips or shame or anything because these, most of these happen to every single relationship, including mine. So what I'm about to share, I hope that inside that you'll say, hmm, man, this, this one is kind of, of one that I need to work on or that, man, that's existing right now in our relationship. But make note of it because in order to change things and help things go better, we have to decrease the negatives, these eight that I'll be talking about, and then increase the positive, the cups of connection that I'll, that I'll share as well. So let me dive into some of these eight, I call these the eight Ds of disconnection or the drainers um, of, the, of the pool. The first one I call drifting. This is very, very common in relationships where we it's called a natural flow to isolation. You don't have to be mean and nasty in relationships. All you have to do is nothing. All you have to do is nothing. You just slowly kind of uh, drift apart. I call it ADD. It's, it's attention deficit dilemma. And all of us get into that. Every single one of us have that where we kind of drift apart where just the busyness, kind of the newness of the newlywed wears, wears off, we get busy. And what happens, my friends, is that when we get casual in our relationships, then we tend to get critical. And again, all of us do this. So not blaming or shaming or pointing fingers in any of this, but just recognizing, yeah, that this often leads then to, uh, I call it affection deprivation. That when we stop putting those cup, cups of connection, not because we don't want to, but man, because we're so busy and we have this and that and work and school and we kids come along and then it's just the craziness. So we naturally drift apart. And I do, I believe that we don't become disconnected because we don't communicate. I think we don't communicate well because we become disconnected. So the first one is, is drifting. The second one I call darts and daggers. Now, this, these are things, I call it darts because those are not, they don't do as much pain. Some of these are pretty painful and daggers quite do a lot more, but I'm talking about things that we do um, emotionally. Emotionally, we, we say things, uh, we call each other names, we're kind of short with each other. So outside of, of abuse and violence, which, which can be a, a dagger in many of our relationships, but these are things that, that cause resentment, right? This is things uh, we, we complain, we get critical, contempt, we get defensiveness, um, and then a, a big one that I want to point out that's very common in a lot of relationships is I call parenting your partner, okay? And again, all of us can, can be guilty of this where we feel like we're telling them, we're reminding them, we're nagging them, and no, 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 don't get off here, get off the next, no, we don't need gas, and it's just like, whoa, 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 that, that can feel smothering. Again, no, no guilt trips here, just being able to awareness, because if we're going to change and improve things, we have to be aware of sometimes to where we slip into parenting our partner, not, not healthy for relationships. So ultimately, we have to be careful to watch our temper, our tongue, and our tone. The things that we say, the tone of voice that we use, the sarcasm, those little zingers that we do, those can be darts in our relationship, and they hurt, and they sting. And ultimately, they, they train some of the connection in our relationship pool. Number three. 
I call disruptions to daily life. Now, this, this is the, you know, we get into these routines, we get into ruts. This can be everything from a, uh, you know, a sick child to, um, a, you know, a sick partner or spouse. You see the little picture there. That husband probably had a hangnail or something. So he's got to go to the emergency. I heard the wives love it when their, when their husbands are sick. Is that, is that true? No, my wife, I don't think any women love it. Yeah. When their, when their partner is sick, but these are just disruptions. It can be moving or lack of sleep or car troubles or starting a new job and the stress increases. And when the stress increases, the romantic side decreases and the connection, I just don't feel as connected because I've got a lot of other things going on. It could be mental health or emergencies, um, in-laws, outlaws, honestly, sometimes. So it can be a lot of things, pregnancy and having a new child and then even a toddler. And I just feel so um, tired. It's just go, 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 go. So disruptions to daily life can cause disconnection. Again, this happens, it happens to all of us. And so it's, this is more about awareness and being aware of these things that can um, draw, draw us apart. Number four is distance. Now I'm talking about physical distance, which can lead to emotional distance. This is for many reasons. Maybe I'm working or at long hours or I have to travel for work a lot. I have multiple jobs or maybe we have different, different hours, but distance can. Now with all of these, of course we can keep that connection but it takes a lot more in, uh, in uh, intentionality. We have to really put our attention in that relationship. I know um, relationships who are physically distant for actually a couple of years, military, for example, but they find ways to add cups of connection to their pool. And if they don't, distance can, can drive us apart. This can even be, you know, try out hobbies, hunting, for example. It, I know it can be anything that kind of takes us apart like, ah, oh, my goodness, I never see you. You're never around or working too much. Again, distance can be a, a divider in some cases. Number five, I call destructive decisions. Now, this can be a pattern. This it can be a pattern of small decisions, like going to your in-laws for the weekend, but man, you didn't know about it. We didn't communicate that. It's like, hey, you're kind of making all these plans and things without letting me know. And it does, it can get um, a little bit of resentment and a little frustration with you. And I don't feel as close and I feel like things are one-sided. It could be secretive stuff as well. Hidden things, spending on credit cards, or it could be, you know, hidden habits or pornography or drugs or substance abuse. Basically anything that's a little bit one-sided in these decisions that can be uh, destructive. So paying attention to those things, being aware, ultimately what it does is it, it diminishes trust, closeness, and, and that connection. So it, it can be basically any kind of decision that feels one-sided and say, hey, we were, thought it was gonna be a, a part of that, or, or I thought that we had discussed this, and then you kind of went, went ahead and made those um, decisions on your own. So someone can feel like, hey, I, 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 thought, I thought we were a team. You know, what, what happened to the, the weeness that are, that's going on in this? So that's number five is destructive decisions. Number six, disagreements and, and defensiveness. So this one is very, very, very common. We're all going to disagree, whether it is it's money, it's sex, it's kids, it's masks, it's vaccines, it's beliefs, church, in-laws. What happens is the anger and irritation and resentment build, and it creates this acid that really eats away at connection and closeness. The truth is that many marital arguments, they're not solved, they're, they're managed because they're things that really don't change personalities and values and beliefs. So it's more about how you disagree. But yeah, but we can get into arguments and, hey, I think you're going to pick this up. And what about that? And so we start, start to kind of nitpick or someone that gets defensive too easily and say, hey, you know, I'd, I appreciate you get, get home a little bit earlier and, and help out. Well, oh my goodness, and someone gets defensive way too fast. Well, fine, yeah, fine, I won't do this anymore. And it, or shaming or guilting or even gaslighting can be, yeah, that drives that, that connection um, apart. And it's, it's like throwing a rock into the pool and splashing that connection out of the pool. So again, this happens to all of us. We all get into disagreements and defensiveness, but we just have to watch how we, instead of being a, a nuclear reactor melting down, to be able to respond rather than, than react. Okay, number seven, daily hassles. This happens again, very, very common. I, whether it's a stressful day at work or long days at home, it's the, the wear and tear of daily life. Uh, many times it's women at home taking care of, of kids and children or bills and this or that. 
and run, 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 run. And now I'm tired at the end of the day and I come home and I'm exhausted, but hey, where are you? Right, romantic night together. And that's one of the last things that, that one partner might want to do because of the daily hassles and the stress and the whining and the messes and the cleaning, cleaning and the cooking and you're not helping out and the, the tummy time and all of that that can just get in the way. And then we kind of live our separate lives and we do what number one is we start to drift. We start to drift apart. Okay, and number eight, as far as some of these disruptions and some of these drainers in a relationship pool, when it comes to our connection, I call it digital distractions. Okay, this one has blown up in the last um, decade, really since 2007, the iPhone comes out and family time gets crunched and screen time goes up. This can be anything from the social media, the scrolling, it can be work and checking email or gaming, um, texting, TV, any kind of screens that really start to, to disrupt. And what happens is it's the scroll, and it can be a good cause, right? No, hey, I'm checking in on this, or I'm doing this for work, or I'm doing this for you, or hey, I need to get a hold of this person. But what happens is when it becomes uh, often one-sided, and if one person might start getting irritated, and they may not might not say anything, but they do, and underneath it's causing resentment. So I did a survey. I did a survey on this, and over 500 people across the United States and found out they said that technoference, this is when technology um, interferes with face-to-face -face human relationships. That's so technoference, when technology interferes with face-to-face -face, um, relationships. 88% agree that technoference is a big problem in society. 55% say their partner is on their phone too much. That's a lot, more than a half in relationships. 45% say technology is a big problem in their marriage and 25% or one out of four say that technology interferes with their sex life. So yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't feel disconnected. I feel ignored. I say, hey, I'm, I'm over here. So a little suggestion on this one. And this one can be a very, very touchy topic. So you have to be careful when you bring it up and not call each other out on this. But honestly, avoiding the tech wreck, here are two places, two suggestions that I suggest that we avoid, that we put away technology. And they are on tables when we're eating and on beds. So you go out to the restaurant and you see couples, first thing they do, they pull out their phones, they're on their phones and you see it all the time. So I encourage you to put away your phones, especially out on dates, put it away unless the menu right is on the phone, but put, put the phone away. At any turn off the TV with, with screens, put it away. Make it a habit of putting tables and beds. That's your own bed. That's your child's bed. Put away because when you hear it go off or bzz, bzz, or the scroll, scroll, scroll your phone, it, it's not it's not helpful in many relationships. And so, yeah, this is a discussion that you have to bring up, talk about it because many people are saying, yeah, this it's technology is overcoming. I don't know how to bring it up because if I call them out, then they get defensive and it causes a big fight. If you feel like, oh man, this is really tough, try try this. Just try it and see if it works. Try, I call it no scroll till noon. Try even just going one day without getting on social media until 12 o'clock, until noon. And just pay attention to how many times that you are drawn to your phone, just to kind of pick it up, maybe to, to check it. We're just kind of mindlessly doing this. So again, if it can be a problem and an issue in many relationships, 55%, more than half are saying, yeah, it, can, it gets in the way. So watch those hats. So with all those Ds, that wasn't meant to say, hey, you know, it's more to, to bring awareness to say, yeah, here's some things that I need to work on. Not pointing fingers at your partner or spouse, but saying, man, I, probably, I could work on this a little bit better. All right. So friends, where do we start? Where do we start? I suggest that we start, remember, we started with some of these needs, with needs, feelings, and then behaviors. So some of this I'm going to share is actually from a, a good friend, Cole, uh, Dr. Cole Ratcliffe at, at BYU-Idaho. He talks about relationship needs circle. Now, what the, the premise is this. Think about, let's say your child, if you have a child, your, your child starts crying and whining after because it's nap time. And so the whining and the crying is the behavior. But what is the feeling and the need underneath the behavior? It, it's tired, right? It's sleepiness. And, but the, it's manifested as a behavior. So in relationships, these are, these are 10 that are very common. The over time, again, they're common in relationships, but if they are persistent over time, it can wear down and we can feel disconnected. So take a look at these 10. Underneath these, these behaviors, again, we're going to talk about needs and feelings. Underneath these are called secondary emotions. And many of us are aware of these. 
but I get angry. And so then I'm going to get nitpicky. I'm going to nag and I'm, I'm upset. And so I'm going to criticize or being disagreeable or I'm feeling anxious. I'm going to withhold love or passive aggressive. This is getting anxious about our relationship. Um, yeah, I'm getting frustrated with you. So then the behavior there's, so the behaviors are out here. I can't emphasize this enough. Pay attention to the feeling. There's always a feeling behind a behavior. Some of these that we don't see as much, these are more of the primary emotions that we don't recognize them as we don't say, okay, I'm feeling lonely. So now I'm feeling anxiety. So I'm now going to withhold my love because I'm frustrated because you're always late. We don't have enough time. You're always on your phone. So then I get angry and then I yell or nitpick. Do you see the pattern that happens perhaps in our own relationships, all relationships, yours and mine, that we, we have this, this feeling? Underneath these primary emotions are these deep, these core needs that we all have. Again, safety, satisfaction, connection, um, fairness, growth, progress, acceptance, appreciation. These, these are the core needs, but we often don't recognize those as the real core issue. So when you see these behaviors in each other, pause, recognize and say, man, what, what is going on? Because often some of these struggles are a result of deep unmet needs deep unmet needs and it's and it's difficult to recognize those but look 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 at your part and say wow what is it that you you ultimately need from me and maybe i need you to help with the children i i feel frustrated i i need um respect i need things to be fair um i need growth and so going back to our core needs if that makes sense can help us get out of these ruts these drainers are on the outside but underneath that are these feelings, these needs, um, primary and secondary emotions. For example, here's the negativity cycle. Here's a poor behavior that leads to negative conflict. Negative conflict then reinforces poor behavior. She's nagging me, so I'm going to withdraw. I withdraw, and now she's like, man, you're really not doing it. I'm going to nag some more. Do you see the cycle? But pausing, and ultimately, right, it drains our pool. Coming back and say, okay, the secondary emotions, common ones are, are anger and anxiety. There, there are others as well. The primary emotions, fear, um, I feel hurt, I feel shame, I feel disappointment, you disappointed me, I get angry, I treat you a certain way, and there's the cycle again. So pausing, recognizing the cycle, and then going back and what is beneath the behavior. It's going to be an emotion, and ultimately it's a, it's a core need that we have. Okay, so next step, now that we kind of set, set all of that up, all right, Dr. Dave, yeah, I, I get this. And yeah, we're, we're drained. Now, what, what do we do about it? What do we do? A better we starts with a better me. And I call this first starting with ourselves. Starting with ourselves, and I call it search inward. So ultimately, I believe that a new you begins with a new view, meaning that we're able to kind of search inward and discover what can I do to, to meet this person's need. How can I, how can I do this? I, I call it uh, the triangle of tough times. Now, how much can you control the circumstances and the stuff that's going on? We have little, we tend to have little control over others' choices and what they do and our circumstances of, of our lives, right? Whether it's, it's COVID or we lose our job or we get a flat tire or things like that. We have little, little to no control. Up here, our own choices, we have a lot more control. So the first is owning your, your bad. Just realize that, that yeah, maybe I do parent my partner a little bit. It, it's your behavior, your attitude and the drama. Being able to say, yes, I own this, that you can't make me mad. I do my personality. I, I'm a controlling personality. I'm a red personality. Maybe I like things this way and organized. And under that is a need for safety. It's this fear of letting go of something. And so then I control behavior and then I nag and I pester. So within yourself, own, own your bad is the first step. Okay, the second step is getting our hearts right. When we get our hearts right, that, that starts with awareness, in, intentional, mindful awareness, intentional, mindful awareness. It begins with humility. It begins with saying, asking ourselves, man, if I were to give my whole heart to my partner, what would occur to me to do? Making sure that we are in a good place, physically, emotionally, that we get our own hearts right in a good place. We have compassion and understanding increases when we're able to, to turn toward our partner and say, wow, what, what ultimately do they, do they need? How can I best meet that need? 
Okay, and being able to, to see others differently when you see them as someone that has these, these needs that, yeah, we're not supposed to meet all, I'm not going there, we're not supposed to meet all of our partner's needs. It's not, they're supposed to meet their needs. We are there to, to help meet their needs as well, as well as your own. But when we, we see them differently, then we'll treat them differently. Does that make sense? Not someone who is annoying and pestering me, but it's our choice ultimately to see them differently. And you can, you could even try this. You could say, all right, if, if I only have one more month with my partner or my spouse, how would I see them differently? How would I treat them differently? If I knew that I had one more month to live or they had one more month to live, would, would it change my response to them? Would I be a little bit more slow to react and, and quicker with compassion for them? I think we can also focus on the 80%. All relationships, we tend to really like, we love, we enjoy about 80% of our partner. There's about 20% that we wish was different, that, that bugs us, that's annoying, that they don't clean up on themselves, that they're a slob, that they're night owls, or whatever it is that, that bugs us, that we wish was different. If we focus on the 80%, then life just tends to go a lot better. If we focus on the 20% that bugs us, then it starts to feel like 80%. So the 80-20 rule, focus on the 80% and quit trying to you know, change that partner. Again, doesn't this is excluding you know, the abuse, the neglect, the violence, the, the power and control things as well. And then ultimately taking care of you, making sure that you are in a good place, healthy. It's getting your heart right. It's getting physically, that you're getting enough sleep and diet and exercise. Those things are critical. So begins with you. And then after searching inward, it is about turning outward. Turning outward, ultimately, John Gottman has found that in all the studies and the stuff that he has done, he says, hey, it's not necessarily like how you argue and saying I statements and the communication. No, he says it's about, it's about friendship. Friendship is the foundation of our relationships, strengthening that, that friendship. And I'll talk about ways we can do that. Connection is really about, hey, are you there for me? Are you there for me? kind of what happened to, to us and both taking some, some ownership and responsibility. So big picture, a secure connection has at least three basic elements and notice that these are beyond the behaviors. Number one is accessibility, basically asking, hey, you give me your attention. Um, and are you emotionally available to me? Remember, it's not just your time. The great, one of the greatest gifts is your attention saying, hey, this person is there. They're available, they're accessible. I feel like maybe you're not, you're, you know, you're not busy or maybe I am, I'm spending too much time with the kids and here, 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 here. And then I give you, I give you the leftovers saying, Hey, I would love to be able to connect, be able to, to talk and kind of be back to us again and, and make making dates a, a priority in our lives. Get responsiveness. You accept my needs and fears and offer comfort and caring. No, I don't, you don't need to meet all of my, my needs. That, that's not a, that our spouse's job to meet all my needs. It's both of us working together to make sure that our needs are, are met. So being responsive, turning toward those bids for, for connection when they are, are offered, um, being aware of the underlying emotions, the fear, the anger, the frustration, and then pausing and saying, man, what can I do? How can I be better? How can I respond better? And engagement, you're emotionally present, you're absorbed, you're, you're all in, you're involved in me, you're aware of my life and my stress, my struggles, you're checking in with me. Maybe it's a little text and say, hey, you're sure thinking about you today. I hope, hope things go well at work or at home or with the kids or with this appointment. But saying, hey, you're, you're engaged, I'm, I'm with you. We're on the same team, on, on the same page. Okay, um, you're probably familiar with Gary Chapman and the five um, love languages. He's written right, all kinds of books now for teenagers and toddlers and left-handed mailmen and, and astronauts. And yeah, he's just gone crazy with a lot of that. But what he's talking about is, is true. It's really being able to recognize um, Wally Goddard has boiled it down to show me, tell me, touch me, those three. And he, he talks about the, how there are three universal ones. And that is time, I think time for all of us. And then being able to slow down and really understand each other. So here's some, some really takeaway tips on this to strengthening your connection. And it's a couple of questions. You can say, you know what? I absolutely love it when you, and then fill in the blank. Whether it is, is help me with dinner, help me with dishes, help me with the kids. I absolutely love it when you, when you surprise me. When you, um, you know, set up dates, when you take charge, when you make decisions, or I absolutely love it, when you 
fill in the blank, fill in the blank and let your partner and your spouse know what you absolutely love to when you feel connected. Uh, whether it is, yeah, you pick me up something, whether it's chocolate, chocolates or flowers, or you pick me up a, a diet Dr. Pepper like my wife does, and she knows I love peanut M&Ms. I, I love it when she, I absolutely love it when she checks in with me, uh, like I did earlier today, right? She sends me a text and just says, hey, you know, good luck today or tonight with this or that. I love it. I absolutely love it. So I need to let her know that. That's called positive reinforcement. Another one is simply saying, I absolutely love it when we fill in the blank, when we do this, when, when we go out, when we have a, 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 when we can go out for a weekend, a getaway. For me and our marriage, speaking for myself, I love getaways. I absolutely love getaways where it's just me and my, I love my kids, right? Don't get me wrong, our teenagers, but I love it when we have something to look forward to, whether it is date night and it's Tuesday night, we are able to go to the movies. I absolutely love it. Right when we can just um, watch our favorite shows or go to the movie or do something together, work on a project together, I absolutely love it when you help me with this. So positive reinforcement. Look at those love languages and, and, and letting your partner know what you really enjoy. Okay, here are ten cups of connection um, uh, that can be dumped into our relationship pools. There, there's a free assessment. You get drdaveshram.com. You can go on there. You can print it out. You can actually read about each of these ten, and then take this assessment. I highly recommend that you do this. That each of you do it separately, and then share with each other how you feel connected. And that's really what this is about is I love it. It could be kindness, random acts of of kindness that you're quick to compliment me, that you notice, that you notice the the new or the nice things that I do, that you notice that, you know, the, the clean house, or I love it right when you vacuum the car for me, notice those little random acts of kindness and then reward it. Say, man, I sure appreciate it. So racks, random acts, acts of kindness, gratitude can be an important one. This is often for those, um, kind of, I call it invisible work. It's the work that you don't notice until it's not done, like the dishes, the laundry, and the clean house, the bed made, or those things around the house that you don't tend to not notice until uh, they're not done. And then all of a sudden, yeah, man, what happened here? Look at this mess or this. So making sure that we're expressing gratitude, for, especially for invisible work. It adds a cup of connection back into our relationship pool. Okay, sacrifice. Be willing to sacrifice and say, hey, no, hey, let me, let me, let me take the kids or you know to practice, or hey, hey, let me do this for for you. Show your your spouse that hey, I put you as priority and I'll sacrifice time and, and something else that I like for you because man, I love you. I'm crazy about you. So sacrifice can be a cup of connection. Affection, this could be non-sexual touch. Just letting know, I love it. For example, me, I love it when my wife will just even touch me. My love language is touch. Whether it's it's a touch, it's a hug, putting her arms around me, um, just rubbing my back. I notice those things. I even notice when she even brushes by me and we barely even touch. I still notice that. After like you know 20 plus years of marriage, I, I notice those things. I love it. Okay, meaningful talk. I like when we just go on a walk. And for me, that's a cup of connection. We just need to be able to, to talk. When you go out on your dates, here's some don'ts. Don't talk about kids. Don't talk about work. And don't talk about money. Okay, those are the top. Those are off limits. When you go out and you have your dates, meaningful talk. You're like, daughter, Dave, what do, we, what do we talk about? Talk about your hopes, your dreams, your fears, things that are coming up that you're looking forward to, not the stressful stuff or what are they doing? Stay away from like the political mass vaccine stuff. <laughs> go away from that stuff. Talk about each other, because that can be adding. Uh, humor, humor can be a great one. How many of you just love when you're used to laugh and they make each other laugh, you have these inside jokes, it's dumping a cup of connection into your relationship pool. Forgiveness, forgiveness is essentially saying, man, I don't feel close. I want to feel close again. I miss, I miss what we had. And yeah, maybe I missed up. I shouldn't have said this. Or I forgot to do this. And man, I'm sorry. I want to feel close again adding a cup of connection to the relationship pool. Fun times is another big one that tends to kind of go, especially during the first few years of, of after marriage and we're, man, we don't make time, kids come along. I feel like we don't have fun anymore. I feel like that we, we need to do fun, enjoyable things. Maybe just um, spontaneous things or, hey, let's plan an, an adventure. Let's do something wild and crazy. Fun times can, let's dump it. I feel connected when we do fun, enjoyable things. Awareness, I can't, 
emphasize this one enough, especially for women. It feels like just being aware of me and my stresses. Maybe it's kids, maybe it's, it's her work, maybe it is um, the, the, her health, her mental health. Simply being aware of her day, uh, of each other's day, and notice those things. So being mentally aware, say, wow, am I really aware? That one is huge because then awareness leads to more attention. Okay, and then uh, um, sexual intimacy, sexual connection. That, that one's super important for many couple relationships. This one can be uh, a deal breaker. It's feel like, wow, I feel like we're drifting. We're not um, not on the same page. And we need a night where we can just plan it and know that that night is coming. And it's not pressure and you're like, I'm faking asleep. And like, oh, please not tonight. But where you're on the same page, where you're able to connect emotionally, sexually, super important. But before that, you have to connect emotionally. And these other nine often will lead, if those are going well, often number 10 comes naturally when you think like, yes. And some people get frustrated. Yeah, I sacrifice Dr. Dave. I do this and this for her. I'll do whatever it is. And it still, it feels like I'm frustrated. So you talk, you say, I love it. I feel so close to you when you're vulnerable to me. And that part of our relationship um, is very important to me. And then you're able to talk and to, to be on the same page when it comes to the sexual intimacy. So again, you can improve your connection, your relationship and connection, but it takes attention. It takes um, intentionally making time, talking about it before you react to poor behavior in relationships. Ask yourself, what is going on underneath that behavior? The nitpicking, the nagging, the prayer partner, the really good defensiveness, the critical. Say, okay, is, is my partner, are they stressed out? You know, a lot. What can I do to support them? I can see that. They're really stressed out. Here's a dinner that they're making. Hey, can you run, grab this or get a can of cream and mushroom from the pantry? I remember my wife asked me one time, oh, man, where's the cream and mushroom? And I know that she wasn't being short, but she was stressed. Uh, it wasn't me. I wasn't the, you know, being the, the idiot. But I was able to recognize that, oh, okay, she's stressed out. So I've, I've got to learn to keep my cool and not react and, and respond to that. Otherwise, you're likely to make things even worse, even if you think you're being helpful watch the behavior, look for the emotion underneath that. So how do you improve your connection? First, you've got to recognize what is draining your relationship pool. What's, what's draining? So you've got to decrease the leaks. You've got to de decrease the negative things that are going on, at least be mindfully aware of what's happening and understanding, wow, what can I do if I were to give my whole heart to my partner, my spouse? If I were to give my whole heart to them, what would occur to me to do? And then notice the nudges and follow the feelings. Because my friends, I feel like too often we're looking, you know, experts and, and this and that in books. If you'll simply be quiet and be still and, and just ask, ask yourself, what does my spouse need from me today? My, my spouse will ask that. My sweetheart, she'll say, what are we going to do today for us? We need to do something for us today. You know, what do we need to do? And I'm like, hey, that's a great question. What, what do we need? What do you need? What do we both need? We, man, maybe we just need to take a break. We need to go get an ice cream. It's not about the ice cream. It's about the getaway to be on the same page because of kids and stress. So asking yourself and notice the nudges and follow the feelings. Okay, start with the unmet needs. Focus on the need beneath the behavior. And then the keys to all this, honestly, is searching inward and then turning outward. A new you begins with a new view. You have to view your partner differently. This is someone who has needs, who has you know, ex expectations and trying to meet those. Not, and again, I don't, you can easily take this to the extreme and be like, oh, that's not my job to meet another. You're right. You're right. But when we can turn outward, because most of the struggles come when, when there is pride and selfishness and it's all about me before marriage, it's me, 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 me monster takes over. You take that into relationship. Then it's not about you. It's about, not about me. It's about we. Then children come along and they get in the way and they get frustrating. And then it's really not about you anymore. So learning to search inward and then turning outward, adding these cups of connection to the relationship will ultimately lack of attention results in loss of connection. So making your partner a priority above phones, above the distractions and, and saying, hey, what can we do for, for us? What do we need to do for us? And that, that's why the, 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 this webinar is not about a magical solution. I gave you 10 ideas for, based on the research about what adds cups of connection to your relationship pool. If you'll take that assessment, if you will literally look and find ways and say, hey, how do you, how do you feel close? 
and say, man, you know what? I love it when you express appreciation for, for me for working hard. I love it when we are physically intimate. Our sexual relationship is super important to me. That, that's a way. And I get it. And sometimes you're not moving. And yes, I can, I can be understanding. But sometimes putting we above me in, in our relationship can, can strengthen that connection. If the other nine of cups of connection, because sexual intimacy just to, to, for sex itself can often do more damage than good. It doesn't bring us closer together. It creates more resentment, but it's really a reflection of all the other things. Um, so taking the temperature in your relationship, making sure that you're taking the, the emotional needs first before the physical needs, because that's a behavior, right? That's out here, sexual intimacy, making sure that we're connected emotionally and those feelings are beneath that. So my friends, I hope that that's been helpful. I know I've talked like a mile a minute. Um, I so keep the, the, the questions coming. I'd love to, we'll turn it over now to some questions. Um, I will take a, a closer look about what questions are coming in so you can um, send those in and I will um, see if I can answer some of those. All right, there it is, Q&A. Okay, so the open questions. Um, I'll just quickly add, make sure to use the Q&A feature, not the chat feature. I do see a question in the chat feature, which is totally fine, um, but just everyone asking questions, make sure to use the Q&A. Okay, hey, yeah, so if you have questions, hey Kate, so a question came in, how, do you, how can you navigate this issue when you know the issues are emotional, but the husband believes the only issue is sexual? Okay, great question. This is an important one. You know, and this is, it's not um, uncommon. You're not alone in this. This can be one of the most frustrating parts of stress, like time, sex, and money, and, you know, work. Those are some of the, the core issues. So sometimes it's going to take, uh, honestly, uh, a good counselor, a good therapist to be able to, to um, help each other view those needs of each other so we can get on the same page. Because it's hardly ever, how can I say that? It's hardly ever actually the sexual relationship, like you're saying. Um, it, it's often things that are underneath these other needs. So you can bring it up. You can talk about it. If you feel like you can risk and share some of those things and have a discussion, but never in the heat of a moment, never when it's like you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, but only when things are going well, and you're on your date and you're saying, man, can we just talk openly and, and share about um, our sexual relationship? Because there's some things that I absolutely love and enjoy about us. And at the same time, yeah, there's some things that sometimes um, can be frustrating and that I wish were just a little bit different, but I want to be make sure that we're on the same page or on the same team. So you always start with, I love, I appreciate, I notice, I love this about a relationship. You can bring up an issue. Um, honestly and openly. And if the person gets really defensive, yeah, don't, then don't keep pushing it. But if you feel like you can't, every time you bring it up and they get defensive and they think it's them, and then I think perhaps it's time to get um, to, to go, to talk with a counselor, to talk with someone else, to be sure that you're on the same, same page. Because you're right, sexual, it's uh, oftentimes it's, it's issues that are beneath the sexual connection. That's an important piece. But for both men and women to be able to understand that, that it is deeper than that, now that's a behavior and we have to go inward to say what are, what are the emotional needs to be able to connect, um, be on the same page for this. And expectations, having realistic expectations, um, super important. Not, so I don't know if, if, if that's helpful, but sometimes I'm getting a third party um, is one of the best investments in your relationship. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, um, this one, yeah, I will share um, live. So this one says, any suggestions on how to navigate building and fostering connection with a partner who does not open up and share themselves honestly and openly emotionally? I'm glad you brought this one up. This is very, very common. There's a great book. Um, it's called, I think it's by Patricia Love, and it's called How to Improve Your Marriage Without Talking About It. I know it, kind of, it sounds kind of weird, um, but being able to then see that, yes, that, that we, and you're thinking, man, how do, how do you even do that? By the book, you know, it takes too long to kind of explain all, all the, the premise here, that essentially um, talking about the, even the relationship circle, you can bring that up. Uh, it's the BYU-Idaho website with Dr. Cole Ratcliffe, bringing that up and then talking about each other's ways of connection. You go through the, the 10 that I talked about, that little self-assessment. Um, but being that vulnerability 
not wanting to, to, and it's not uncommon because oftentimes it is a fear, especially for men, it is this, this fear of being vulnerable, feeling of, of wanting to open up and, and become more um, emotional and show that side of me. It, it's, it's ultimately a fear. It is ultimately a fear. And so um, you kind of navigate that through the, I notice and I appreciate, and here's some things that I would love to be able to love you more deeply in order to do that. I, I need to know where you are, you know, emotionally. And again, if that is not working, it feels like, man, we're frustrated. I highly recommend, I think everyone actually needs therapy. We all need to be able to, um, to go. And if they're not willing to go, then that, that's a whole nother issue to say, hey, I feel like we're not on the same page. I would love for us to take our relationship to, to a deeper level, to be able to be able to openly talk and to share. And, and I get it. And I can respect that, that, that this is not, it's uncomfortable for you um, to share some of the things, but then to, for you to be vulnerable and say, I love it when, or I appreciate it when, and then when they do share anything at all, just to be like, man, I, it means the world to me that you opened up, that you shared some of that. Because some of it can be deep wounds, right? And emotional things or things from childhood or trying to be, you know, macho man, and being very self-protective. So those walls don't mean that like they don't love you. They often just don't know how to show it. And often, honestly, are not don't know about their own needs. They haven't seen those because they don't see like, ah, oh, my core need is I need to, to know that I'm, I'm a provider and then I um, that things are going well, that you're safe, that there's growth in this uh, to you know, be appreciated. Um, so that can, it can be really tricky. But being vulnerable yourself, opening up and staring with the I know and I appreciate the last how to not do it is the the nitpick, the nag, the kind of the point of the finger. Why don't you ever open it? What, what is it about you? Why, why are you afraid? Or why? I don't get it. But it's kind of that push, push, push. Well, 90% of the time create re, um, resentment, that defensiveness. But when you can say, you know, I, I would love to know just a little bit more of the deeper side of you, more of the, because there's the superficial you, there's the personal you, and then there's the deeper, the validating you. And I would love to know more of your, your hopes and dreams. Start with things small and then say, wow, thanks for opening up about that. Like I had no idea. And when you share, I feel so much more closer to you. So hopefully those are some, some suggestions of taking any little bit of openness or vulnerability, emotions, and then taking it and being like, wow, I don't know, that, that may have been really hard for you, but I love that, that you just opened up and, and shared. Okay, um, let's see. Um, yeah, so this one, how, how do we, how do we balance communicating when he uses a lot of words and she uses few? So again, I come back to that, that, the book, ha, um, how to improve your marriage without talking about it. It's just so helpful when it comes down to communication stuff, because even beyond communicating, it's often something that, that is deeper that I don't want to talk about it, that I don't, I don't enjoy that. So being able to then recognize and point out and emphasize the good things and not forcing another person to communicate, whether it's a, it's a man or a, a woman or both. Um, you use a lot of words and she uses few being able to say, man, you know, let me pause. I would love to hear more of your thoughts. I would love, it's the, I appreciate, I, I absolutely love it when you, and I absolutely love it when we, and I would love, you know, to, to be able to enjoy our relationship and to be able to share more deeply. I love it when you open up and share that more vulnerable side of you and you risk, and I know it can be risky. And I know you don't actually like and enjoy um, opening up and sharing a little bit more or um, you tend to be quiet, you tend to turn inward. And, and hey, I, I love you no matter what. And so, um, again, maybe going to a therapist, talking with someone, a counselor about helping. But for many people, especially men, that is even more difficult. And I don't want to, to, to open up to anybody else. And so it can be take some patience and time, some love, some unconditional love. And then just noticing and just pouring the cup of communication on like you never have before, being vulnerable to, to them and then seeing if they will open up. And then when they do, just, man, I love it. Thank you so much. Um, okay, some more. 
Um, okay, so since you're working opposite shifts, commuting, going to school. Okay, so some suggestions when you're working opposite shifts, commuting, going to school, get scheduled at work, way too many days in a row. This one's tough. And, and so it sounds like the distance one that we talked about earlier, the distance, the different shifts, the disconnecting, and it's, hey, we kind of come and go. Ultimately, something has to give. And making your relationship a priority and saying, oh, man, you know, I, I can't go into work. You know what? I'm going to call my boss and let them know my relationship really is a priority and I wish I could, but this really means the world to me and I can't put this or that at risk. Now, when you are commuting, finding ways to, to connect, maybe it's most, it's messages, maybe it's notes, maybe it's text throughout the day. It's, it's um, a letter of appreciation that you hand write that you actually send to their work or it's flowers or it's finding ways to connect using those, those 10 kind of cups of connection, finding ways Say, man, you know, hope you have a great day at work. I sure miss you. Can't wait for this weekend. Yeah, something to look forward to. That that's also kind of brings you hope. It's like, okay, come, go. We're on different pages. I can't wait until later tonight, or I can't wait until Thursday for date night. It's it's still whether it's words and it's um, you know pictures sent to each other, finding ways that make of connection that makes sense to you is super, super, super important. Um, and some of that is the test and say, man, we're really struggling on this day shift. What do you need from me? How can I help us keep this connection strong? Fill out that little survey. I, I hope that you'll do it because it says, I feel connected when, and you read through these 10. Um, so that, that one's not easy. Okay, how to find um, a good therapist. Do you see new patients? So I, I got a full disclosure. Uh, I am the kind of doctor, as my kids say, that, that doesn't help people. I'm not, I'm not a licensed therapist, so I am not a therapist. You can get online, um, Utah uh, Association for Marriage and Family Therapists, or find that there's good sites. Often it's word of mouth, honestly, because, okay, I might get in trouble for saying this. Therapists can be harmful for your marriage. Okay, if you don't find the good fit and you're like, oh, thanks, Dr. Dave. But if you go to this one and you're like, okay, this is not, or my husband does not relate to this one or this one was very put off-putting. Finding the right fit is key for, for counseling, for finding a good therapist. And so, yeah, I do know some kind of in Northern Utah that I can recommend. Um, you can reach out to some universities. For example, BYU has a great marriage family therapist program. Utah State does as well. You can reach out to them and say, hey, can I get some referrals or asking friends, family, which is kind of awkward. Like, hey, what therapist do you go to? It's being vulnerable. The being open to get, receive help can work wonders, work wonders. But it does. It takes word of mouth. Um, getting on some of those websites as, as well. Um, let's see. This is, this is really um, tough. Um, all right, I'm going to tackle this one. We've got a couple of minutes. What suggestions do you have for couples where one partner is doing a lot of emotional, psychological work and the other has an unresolved trauma history, gets easily flooded, is not open to doing their own work, continues to criticize and blame their partner? This one is difficult because it can be so easily then to become frustrated and the behavior, remember the, the relationship circles, the behaviors to nitpick and to be and be critical. Um, a lot of that honestly will take some dedication, some openness and say, hey, I really feel I'm willing to, to go to bat. For, I, I'm willing to do anything for our marriage. And if the other person says, you know what, I am too. Let's find someone to, there, there's trauma, there's something early on. Um, in past to past relationship and it's hard we, we close off to each other and that vulnerability can take time it can take patience it can take that love language and the little little successes and then closing up again and so finding i can't i can't emphasize this enough a good therapist uh, which is tough to find i know i'm um, reaching out to uh, yeah counselors um and then I mean, sharing, sharing this, right? This type of resources, good, good books. I can recommend um, some of my Dave's face. Reach out to me through email, uh, david.shram. And maybe Camille, you can put my email up there, david.shram at usu.edu. If you have other questions or need referrals or things, that's what I'm here for, honestly, in extension, is to, is to help connect people to resources that will be helpful. There it is. So david.shram, I'm giving, I'm giving you my email to reach out if you have specific questions or things. I, again, not a therapist. I do a lot of relationship and marriage education and, you know, prevention workshops, that kind of stuff.
but not as much um, on the therapy end. Um, all right. Praise your We have lots of good where we start to get that connection back. This one is one of the most common. I'm glad that you asked that we've got like a minute left. After five years of marriage, we have lost our connection due to various reasons. Where do we start to get that connection back? I'm glad that you brought this up. First is, is identifying, not to blame or shame, but identifying kind of your part. And often it's it's a we, you know, it's a we issue. And it ranges those, those eight um, big ones. Those are not the only ones that, that cause disconnection or that draining in the relationship pool. But this is very, very, very common. All of us actually go through this first to normalize it and say, you, you're not alone in this. Even Dr. Dave, right? We get into relationship ruts and we're kind of going our own ways. And I feel like, man, we've, we've lost some of this. Start really small. Start by it's just simply uh, a simple text and say, man, I love your guts, you know, in the morning to that, that person. Um, okay. Here's another, another principle. Um, negativity comes back fast, like getting defensive. That t- stuff tends to come back fast. Positivity tends to come back slowly. Does that make sense? So negativity comes back fast. Positivity comes back slowly, but you're, you're truly asking yourself, what can I do? And then notice the nudges, follow the feelings of the small little cup it's a cup of connection at a time a big trip to hawaii may not do it if there's more emotional stuff that that connection but it can start why hey what is their love language what can i do to to share them let them know that man i am i feel bad because we're kind of neglecting each other i'm not blaming last one thing you want to do is blame or shame the other person but say hey i own it i i know i get busy i get fresh with the kids whatever it is i'm just making all this up but knowing and owning kind of the, the bad, right? The behavior, the attitude, the drama, the stuff, and, and starting really, really small because what that does is it creates an upward spiral that can help that relationship to grow, to reconnect, to rekindle, to get some of that fun, enjoyable stuff back. Patience is key. It's not all of a sudden you're not going to feel connected or even one sexual great, you know, connection that we had sexually. It doesn't always do it. In fact, that, that can be the beginning. And for often the male, it can feel like, yeah, you know, I feel really connected, but they can tell emotionally if, a, if a, um, the partner is not, not there and into it. So that can be frustrating for the guy. Yes, hey, sexual connection and say, hey, hey, emotional connection, getting on the same page, non-sexual touch and say, man, we just need to, to get back to us. Let's hold off sexually for a minute, okay? If that comes, that's great. But we, we need just the non-sexual touch. I need to know you're there. I, I need to know that you care for me, that you're checking in. And so it's the little things, the random acts of kindness. It's the gratitude. It's the awareness. It's checking in. Maybe it's the humor, the funny parts of it. But, but check those and then swap and say, hey, this is how I feel connection. Hey, this is how I feel connection on those 10 cups. And then start doing those. It's little. It's okay. This is it. It's small things often. It's small things often in your relationship pool. It, it splashes, those come, you know, these zingers. It takes five times as much positivity in your relationship pool to feel that connection. So be patient and be consistent because it is, really is small things often that gets that connection back. And it varies. I can't just say this is what you need to do because it varies from couple um, to couple, relationship to relationship. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Um, Okay, there's a bunch more, and, I, and I'm out of I'm out of time for this. But, um, send me these, okay? Send me these because I will. I promise I will, I'll respond because I love doing this. I, I love to be able to help people through things, even though I'm not a therapist. Um, where I can suggest some resources or some books or some websites or articles that can be helpful. So I went as fast as I could. Um, thank you so much. Thanks for coming tonight. I hope that it's been helpful. Again, if you find it helpful. Um, you're going to receive a survey. So Camille is going to send out, you're going to get something for the Utah Marriage Commission. I hope, please take time to, to fill it out. It only takes, uh, man, just a few seconds of your time, but it really helps us get back to the funder to say, hey, you know, people enjoy these or don't enjoy these and these topics. Um, but please, 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 please take a minute to, to fill out the survey, do that for us. And then we continue to provide these, these webinars. We do these like every two weeks. So sign up. There's a great ones that have happened before to look at those archive webinars on stronger marriage, um, org. So, uh, I'm going to take a breath and take a, take a drink and send it back to Camilla. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Dave. I know everyone's giving you a silent round of applause right now. Um, so yeah, just as mentioned, please fill out the survey um, on your way out. It'll pop right up. 
And a recording of this webinar will be available tomorrow. You'll have it emailed straight to you. Um, everyone who registered for this, um, this webinar will get a link to the, the recording tomorrow. Um, and also, um, just again to reiterate, if you are looking to get a CE certificate, please email me at marriagecommission at usu.edu um, to request one and I can get that to you. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's everything. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for um, everybody for um, being with us tonight. Thanks all. Bye. See you.